the White House on edge. A new book dishing on the chaos Trump aides now anonymously trashing Rudy Giuliani. And a new report from ABC that almost as soon as Trump won the race, a star apprentice executive producer you may have heard of, Mark Burnett, was trying to link a Putin-affiliated American banker to Donald Trump's transition team. Now, this attempted meeting did not go down, but congressional investigators honing in on the goal and why Russia and rubles seem to always be such a high priority. This report has not been confirmed by NBC News. Then there's the president's criminal defense lawyer for the Russia probe back on the dance floor doing the Giuliani walk back. He's gone from saying Trump talked to Cohen about a Trump Moscow tower to claiming that was some kind of hypothetical to now saying if they did talk about it, that wouldn't be a crime. Understanding that, it, that they went on throughout 2016, more than a lot of them, but there were conversations, could be up to as far as October, November. Our answers cover until the election. So just to clarify, talks of Trump Tower Moscow went as late as October or November of 2016, even in, a, be, in right. some form. Could be. Could be. Giuliani also doing a meandering interview with The New Yorker that's making some waves. And I want to be very crystal clear about it. The key to decoding this kind of Giuliani interview is to ignore the talking points and focus only on the secrets Giuliani seems to spill by accident. It is like the romantics famously said, I hear the secrets that you keep when you're talking in your sleep. Well, Giuliani spilling some secrets here. He mentioned secret tapes and whether St. Peter will ultimately think he lied for Trump at the gates of heaven. Let me take a quick look with you on the tapes. Giuliani says he listened to tapes to fact check some recent media articles and then tries to take it back saying, well, I shouldn't have said tapes. And then when asked about lying for Trump, he says, well, I'm afraid it'll be on my gravestone. Rudy Giuliani, he lied for Trump, adding somehow, I don't think that'll be it, but if it is, so what? Do I care? I'll be dead. I figure I can explain it to St. Peter. Getting pretty deep there. Now, as we say around here, Giuliani, gonna Giuliani. But even someone inside the Trump administration now says they're over it. And this is a current Trump aide talking about the Giuliani dance. A senior administration official says basically, quote, Rudy Giuliani's public comments are not helping, helping when they question why he keeps going on TV. If nothing good can come of it, quote, don't do it. I'm joined now by Barrett Berger, a former U.S. assistant attorney with both the Eastern and Southern District of New York, where there's been a lot of action, and Barbara McQuaid, former federal prosecutor, and Matt Miller, a former chief spokesman for the Justice Department in the Obama administration. Uh, greetings to all of you. Uh, Matt Miller, do you think there are secrets that can be found uh, as Rudy does these interviews, and what does it tell you that Trump aides are, are starting to pipe up about it? Uh, you know, I think it's very difficult because you never know when he's telling the truth or not. Um, you know, it, I think it's pretty clear at this point, Rudy Giuliani, his best days are, as a lawyer are behind him, but he's actually even worse as a public spokesman. And when you watch his interviews, the thing that's striking to me, it is one thing to go on television, make admissions that are damaging to your client but happen to be factually true. Um, you sometimes let a bad fact slip out publicly. It is another thing to go on television and make admissions about your client that may not even be true. And this example of, of saying the discussions continued as far as November, October, November of 2016, an extremely damaging admission for, for Donald Trump. But it may not be true. It wouldn't match the public record we've seen in the case that, that seems to indicate those discussions ended in the summer of 2016. So I can understand why other members of the Trump legal team and other members of the Trump communication team would be upset with Giuliani because he takes opportunities, you know, he takes moments like this weekend when, you know, BuzzFeed had had this story knocked down by the special counsel's office, should have been a win for him. And he goes out and creates not just one, but two, three uh, entirely new damaging well, news just, cycles about stuff that may not even be true. You put your finger on it. I mean, you've, you've done this kind of work and it is difficult sometimes to walk the line of being accurate but also secretive about open investigations. Uh, you did it for the DOJ. Other folks do it when they're on the other side of these probes. Uh, this could have been a time where the news of the headline tonight is still the fallout from Mueller rebutting a public media account. We, we covered that story last night. But instead, you've got headlines uh, and banners across TV screens about Rudy talking about his gravestone talk, saying maybe he lied for Trump. 
Yeah, look, I think there are a few problems. One is he doesn't have a very clear command of the underlying facts. And when you go out and you try to talk about an event uh, about events without having an understanding of the facts with something that is so important and where the facts matter so much as they do in this investigation, you're going to make mistakes. The other thing is that he has, seems to have no, um, no, no concern about the fact that if he, he might say something that contradicts what he said previously, what his client said previously, and then he makes these kind of off-the-wall statements, like mm -hmm. this statement about um, about you know what'll happen when he dies and goes to heaven. It would you would expect an attorney in that situation to say, "No, I'm not worried about that. I never lie on behalf of the president because I don't have to because my client did nothing wrong and I expect him to be fully exonerated." It's pretty odd that he said the said the opposite of that. Let me go to Barrett and say I want to get into what your argument would be uh, to St. Peter uh, if you ever have that situation. But before we get to that. Uh, Witness a Fox News anchor uh, basically piling on Rudy uh, and then Don Jr. piling on Cohen here. We're seeing the, some of the problems in this type of public defense. Take a look. When was the last discussion about this Trump Tower deal? Because Rudy got everybody really confused, I have to say. I don't know. I, I, I don't talk about things that I don't know about. We don't know the <laughs> anything about it. Ultimately, it was Michael Cohen essentially trying to get a deal done. You know, he was there for a long time. He wasn't exactly a deal guy. He didn't bring too many to the table, so I don't think anyone took it all that seriously. What do you see happening there with a, a witness or potentially more than a witness in Don Jr. talking about Cohen, who, of course, uh, may have more to say in public. Yeah, I mean, I have to say I actually, in, in some small way, agree with Trump Jr. in that statement that you shouldn't go and publicly talk about things that you don't know everything about. I mean, there is no need for Giuliani to be giving public statements at this point. You know, he really, and I think many lawyers would agree, that the best way to let the facts talk is in court when there's actually facts, when you can do it sort of in a controlled environment. I think what we're going to see with Cohen is a very different approach when he's testifying. You're going to see this in a controlled environment. It's going to be you know, very prepared. It's, of course, going to not cover everything he knows about because there's going to be some areas that are probably still the subject of ongoing investigation, so he's not going to get into that. But you're going to see a much different you know, type of, of statement than you see from Giuliani. Cohen's not going to get up there and you know, ramble on for you know, an hour about things that he doesn't know anything about. It's going to be much more carefully controlled and, and obviously in response to questions from the um, from the Congress. And you you worked in the office uh, that Rudy used to run when he was U.S. attorney. What do you think of Matt's point that, that he's just not, uh, according to some analysts, as good at lawyering anymore? Yeah, I mean, look, it's not open heart surgery, but even in the law, precision matters. It's important to be careful with the facts. It's important to be careful with the law. And if you're not going to do that, you shouldn't be talking. It's not open heart surgery, but if you go in to operate on the 100%. heart and then you, you just remove the liver and you never do anything to the heart. Right. I mean, that's the level of mistakes that we're, we appear to be seeing unless, and we've debated this with our folks, unless you see this as some grand strategy. But I think Matt's point uh, that Rudy has taken everyone away from a winning argument and back into a losing one is, is striking. And it comes at a time that we may be in, we don't know, but we may be in the home stretch of this whole probe. Is this Rudy's closing public argument? No, this is exactly right. They had a win there. They had a win with the you know special counsel's office coming and disputing BuzzFeed's story, and it, Giuliani's statements really changed the focus of the conversation, and it changed it in a direction that's you know not really good for the Trump legal team at this point. Which comes back to my point of there is no obligation for him to be making these kind of statements right now, especially when you know they were sort of on the wave of this this good news story. It, it seems that it would be you know wise counsel to you know limit his his statements to legal papers. Uh, Barbara, your view on, on any of the above? I think one of the reasons that we're seeing Rudy Giuliani fumble the message on this is it's a real hot potato. He knows that this is a very significant matter. I think there's some clues out there that let us know that this is a really important issue. Uh, number one is Michael Cohen's guilty plea. He had already pleaded guilty to eight counts in the Southern District of New York, um, and Robert Mueller insisted that he plead to an additional count about lying to Congress about Trump Tower in Moscow. That tells me that they are paving the way uh, to have him cooperate against others who may be implicated in that as well. And the other thing is if President Trump is continuing to negotiate a deal into October and November when he is telling the public he is not, not only does that harm his credibility, but that means Russia knows he's lying, hmm. which gives them leverage over him who is about to become the president of the United States to be used to coerce him uh, to, uh, to comply with their demands. So I think this is a very big deal, and I think hmm. that's why Giuliani is having so much trouble 
handling the questions. Mm. And Barbara, uh, I want to get your view on some of these witnesses. You were uh, on this program when one witness, uh, Sam Nunberg, uh, famously was saying he might defy the request to testify. He ultimately did. Uh, another set of witnesses that we've talked to uh, are also going back and forth. Jerome Corsi is both suing the Mueller probe uh, to some degree uh, civilly. He's also, though, now saying he's essentially cooperating and that he has given testimony. Uh, and then he, the last time he was on this show, said, look, he's not going to get into a debate with Roger Stone. That is also shifting in the news this week. Take a listen to what he's saying now. Quote, I'm done tolerating Alex Jones and Roger Stone's lies and defamation. My lawyers are right. I never held a government job. I'm not FBI, CIA, or Mossad. Throwing a little Israeli intel there. I never received hush money from Infowars. I'm not testifying for Mueller, which is to say cooperating, but not, you know, going into court to implicate people. I will take appropriate steps to protect my reputation. Uh, I wonder what you think about this, because there's a lot of different things that happen uh, in high profile cases. But this is, I think, even yet and still unusual uh, and how Mueller is handling continuing to get testimony from these individuals as they feud in public and continue to circle Roger, who reportedly has not gone in yet. Yeah, you know, it's easy to talk tough in the in the public and in the press. Uh, but when you receive a grand jury subpoena and the consequences of failing to comply with that subpoena are sitting in jail, then um, sometimes uh, the, the path uh, that you want to follow becomes very clear. I think with Jerome Corsi, you know, he is the one who disclosed that he had received a plea offer from Robert Mueller to plead guilty to false statements relating to his conversations with Roger Stone regarding WikiLeaks. Uh, R Robert Mueller would not have made that plea offer unless he was prepared to back it up with criminal charges. Mm. And so I think that well, it, when he refused that, they told him, well, the next step then will be indictment unless you want to uh, change your mind. And it appears now maybe he has done so um, and changed his mind and agreed to cooperate, knowing that criminal charges may be the consequence mm. if he fails to do so. Barrett, I'm curious your view of that. Uh, we're very careful. Uh, about ever discussing anyone as a potential target of a probe. Um, but we have the written documentation that Barbara mentions, that Bob Mueller uh, told Jerome Corsi, you're a target. This is literally what your indictment will look like written out. Um, your analysis of, of where that heads and what the purpose of that is at this stage in the probe. Yeah, I actually don't think that's so uncommon. I, I think prosecutors will often have you know, a conversation with somebody that they're trying to potentially sign up as a cooperating witness where they will lay out all the charges and say, this is exactly what you're facing. And they don't do it as a threat. They don't do it you know, as a, a scare tactic. It's really so somebody has all of the information so that they can actually make an informed decision. And in your experience, how often does that result in an indictment if the people don't play ball? Almost always. It's very unlikely that a prosecutor would go through the trouble of, you know, drafting up a, a draft indictment or information, whatever the, the paper actually is that they were giving him, discuss the potential charges, have that cooperation conversation, and then just let it go. That's, it's not really how, you know, prosecutors, at least that work at this level, operate. Yeah. And, and Matt Miller, uh, in closing, I wonder, uh, as we always try to assess what we've learned and what we could do better. It, with the smoke cleared a little bit from all of the uh, Friday BuzzFeed excitement, what do you think is the most important thing for people who want to do this responsibly in the press or the citizenry? And plenty of, of members of Congress were tweeting, you know, big if true. Uh, what's, what's to you the big takeaway there? Well, a few things. First of all, if you want to really rely on something, look for what's filed in court. When people file documents in court and are willing to, you know, if it's the government willing to put uh, the facts behind them, willing to put their reputations behind them. And then when it comes to reporting, my clue for reporting is, look, the best stories will, will not remain what we like to call permanent exclusives. If you see a news outlet move permanent a story. Permanent exclusive, and, you're saying, is a, that's a warning uh, sign. Uh, it, yeah, a story that's not matched by any other outlet. So when you see a major story move, wait to see someone else confirm it. And if you don't, that's when you might have questions about it. And we We've had some other big permanent exclusives in this investigation um, that, you know, to this day haven't been confirmed. Mm. Uh, Matt Miller, Barbara McQuaid, and Barrett Berger, thanks to all of you. I appreciate it. Hey, I'm Ari Melber from MSNBC. You can see more of our videos right here, or better yet, subscribe to our YouTube channel below. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here with us, and we appreciate that.